if you've ever been at a trailhead in a park, a national park, and you get to a board at the trailhead that says, you are here, have you ever wondered how they know? So we're going to talk just a little bit about modern GPS technology. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I've got a GPS in my BMW. I really don't need to hear this talk. But we're going to be talking about what you need to know about a GPS in terms of what it can do and what it can't do, which can be really important for rescue and really important if you're using it to make your way around in the backcountry. So, an introduction to GPS as a technology. I'm not going to be training you how to use it because I'm sure you already know. So, in the US, GPS's work by using a constellation of GPS satellites and there are essentially 24 of them that are operational. There are a few extras that they bring into place when they need to. 24. That's why a lot of GPS's will say they have 12 channels. 12 seems kind of arbitrary, but 12 channels equals the amount of satellites in a perfect world that you might have in a single hemisphere in an open area, like open desert or open ocean. 12. Interestingly, GPS satellites are neither low earth orbiting satellites nor geosynchronous satellites. Now low earth orbit interestingly is just a couple hundred miles or so above the earth's surface. Geosynchronous satellites like XM satellites, Iridium satellites, the ones they use for SPOT, those are 23,000 miles above the Earth's surface. Big difference between low Earth orbit and geosynchronous. It turns out that GPS satellites are sort of a hybrid, sort of middle distance, but they're pretty high. And they're constantly moving around, so the geometry of those satellites is constantly changing. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. The satellite geometry is important. We said that these satellites are constantly moving. And we said that in a perfect world, you've got 12 out, but the truth is, you'll almost never have 12 GPS satellites that your GPS receiver will be looking at at any given moment. So, if you were to actually look at a hypothetical model of how many GPS satellites are visible at any one moment, even if you're out on the ocean, it varies from 5 to 12, but it's usually averaging about 6, 7, or 8. Certainly, normally, not 12. The best geometry in a perfect world, let's say if we only had four satellites that we could see. Now we said that there's usually at least five satellites visible, but let's say one is obscured by terrain or a tree. So what would be the best geometry? The best geometry would be is if you could have a GPS satellite essentially trisecting the horizon as low as possible, three GPS satellites, and then a third directly overhead. That's really good geometry if you've only got four satellites visible. Really bad geometry is a big clump of satellites that are very close to each other, somewhere clumped together in the sky. Now, on most GPS receivers like this one, you can actually look at an almanac which will show you where the satellites are. And just knowing what I just said, you can figure out what the accuracy is going to be, at least extrapolate. If they're all clumped together in one spot, it tends to be really poor accuracy. If they're spread out, especially spread out close to the horizon with one overhead, really good geometry, you're going to tend to have very good accuracy. So I think most people realize, at least most of you realize, that the way a GPS receiver works is by somehow triangulating information from all of these satellites. But I'd like to look at that a little bit more closely. Is that super important for rescue? No, but I'm kind of a geek and I find it interesting. So a couple things about that. Number one is if you're into any form of navigation, whether you're a pilot, a backpacker, hiker, you're a mariner, you're going to know that speed times time equals distance. Well, that same form formula that navigators have been using for close to a zillion years is the same thing that your GPS receiver is doing. So, the speed of light is a constant, 186,000 miles per second. So if we know how much time it took to get from the satellite to your receiver, we can figure out a distance. And so if you've got, say, three or four or five satellites, you can start to triangulate a distance. It's actually a system that's called trilateration, but I'm not going to go into detail on that right now. Now, that sounds really good, doesn't it? So, 
we could be done with this segment and you could go drink a beer. But guess what? It's not that simple. Because it turns out that this GPS receiver doesn't really know where it is. It doesn't know where it is, so it can't know how much time it took for that signal to get from the satellite to it. If it doesn't know where it is yet, it can't know what time it is, and it can't know how far it is to that satellite. So it's kind of a catch-22. So we're going to talk about how your poor little GPS receiver deals with this conundrum. Does this GPS receiver have an atomic clock in it? Because it has to have a really precise ability to know what time it is. And the answer is no. This little GPS receiver has the same timepiece that my wristwatch has, which is a quartz crystal. So how does it really know what time it is? Because it needs to have very accurate time in order to know what the distances are from the satellites. Well, it's talking to an atomic clock that lives on board all of the GPS satellites. So, now it's starting to look pretty simple. We've got an atomic clock on board the satellite. We've got the ability to talk to that atomic clock with our GPS receiver. So therefore, if you know exactly what time it is, you can figure out exactly how long it took for that signal to get to the GPS receiver. But wait, there's a problem. And the problem is that this GPS receiver can't really know what time it is because it doesn't know where it is yet. I just turned it on and it's struggling to figure out where it is. So how can it know how much time it took for this signal to get from the receiver if it doesn't even know where it is and it doesn't even know what time it is? You can say, of course it knows what time it is. It talks to an atomic clock. But if it doesn't know where it is, it can't know how long it took for that signal to get to it. So, hence, it doesn't really know what time it is. So what your poor little GPS receiver does while it's initializing and you're waiting for it to turn on and you're going, what is taking that little GPS so long to initialize and acquire a position? Well, what's taking it so long is it is creating a series of relatively sized spheres and trying to figure out the solution to the problem of where do all of these fuzzy spheres, if you will, intersect. And it's doing thousands of computations to try to acquire a single solution to that problem. And when it does, ping, you have a position, it's happy, you're happy, and you stop cursing at this poor little thing that's been struggling to acquire your position. There are a couple important sources of error using GPS's. And one important source of error we already talked about, which is satellite geometry. So there's good geometry and bad geometry. There are a couple other things that can happen. One is just ionospheric uh, interference can affect the quality of the signal you're getting. But an important one, especially when you're a climber, you're in a river canyon, you're dealing with cliffs, there's something called multipath error. And with multipath error, you're getting the signal from the GPS satellites that's actually bouncing off a canyon wall, say, and then coming to your receiver that might be five miles away and uh, that can increase the length of time it takes for that signal to get to your receiver and therefore your GPS thinks you're in a different position than you are. So always consider multipath error.